Welcome to Come Follow Me. We're in the New Testament week 24, and we're covering John 14 through 17 today. From the Institute Manual, on the final evening of his mortal ministry, after the Last Supper was concluded, the Savior gave instructions to his disciples as recorded in John 14 through 16. At that time, the Savior taught his disciples vital truths concerning love, obedience, and the Holy Ghost. Truths that would prepare them for his arrest and crucifixion, as well as for their roles as leaders in his kingdom. Elder McConkie pointed out that the Lord's teachings on this occasion included some of the mysteries of his kingdom, some of the deep and hidden doctrines, some things that can be understood only by the power of the Spirit. The Savior's teachings about what the Holy Ghost can do for us are among the clearest instructions on the Holy Ghost in all of Scripture starting in chapter 14 of John. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Continuing in verse 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. From the prophet Joseph Smith. The statement, in my Father's house are many mansions, should be, in my Father's kingdom are many kingdoms, in order that ye may be heirs of God and the joint heirs with me. There are mansions for those who obey a celestial law, and there are mansions for those who come short of law, every man in his own order. From Elder Corbridge, there is only one way to happiness and fulfillment. He is the way. Every other way, any other way, whatever other way, is foolishness. We can either follow the Lord and be endowed with his power and have peace, light, strength, knowledge, confidence, love, and joy. Or we can go some other way, any other way, whatever other way. And go it alone without his support without his power without guidance in darkness turmoil doubt grief and despair and i ask which way is easier there's only one way to happiness and fulfillment jesus christ is the way i saw this advertisement on an online magazine that was a doormat preaches a little bit of false doctrine from mosiah 3 17 and moreover, I say unto you, there shall be no other name given, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. From Elder Uchtdorf, God wants you to find your way back to him, and the Savior is the way. God wants you to learn of his Son, Jesus Christ, and experience the profound peace and joy that comes from following the path of divine discipleship. As I was studying for this week, I came across this chart that talks about the five different love languages. And it reminded me of when I was newly married. And I remember thinking about how to demonstrate love. And so when my wife asked me if I loved her, I thought, oh, how can I show my love? And so my way of communicating love was to do things. So I washed the dishes, you know, vacuumed. The more she wanted to know if I loved her, the more I did. But that's not what she wanted. Her love language was one of using words of affirmation. She wanted to hear from me that I loved her. And I would suggest that there are actually six ways, because according to the scriptures, if you love me, keep my commandments. From John 14, 15. And then in John 14, 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Then in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. From Carol Stevens, we may feel at times that God's laws restrict our personal freedom, 
take from us our agency and limit our growth. But as we seek for greater understanding, as we allow our Father to teach us, we will begin to see that his laws are a manifestation of his love for us. And obedience to his laws is an expression of our love for him. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. But the comforter, this is verse 26, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. From the Institute Manual, in the New Testament, the Greek word parakletos, translated comforter in the King James Version, appears only in the writings of John. The word is composed of para, meaning beside, and kletos, meaning one who is summoned. A parakletos is one who is summoned to another side as a helper, intercessor, or advocate. In John's writings, the title parakletos is applied to two individuals, the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ. The Savior promised his disciples that after he departed, they would not be left alone, but would have the companionship of the Holy Ghost to help them. The Savior's promise that he would give his disciples the Holy Ghost as another comforter meant that he himself also was a comforter. From the prophet Joseph Smith, there are two comforters spoken of. One is the Holy Ghost, the same as given on the day of Pentecost, that all saints receive after faith, repentance, and baptism. This first comforter is the Holy Ghost. The other comforter spoken of is a subject of great interest and perhaps understood by few of this generation. After a person has faith in Christ, repents of his sins, is baptized for the remission of his sins, and receives the Holy Ghost, which is the first comforter, then let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, and living by every word of God, and the Lord will soon say unto him, Son, thou shalt be exalted. When the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then that man will find his calling and his election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as recorded in the testimony of St. John. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. And at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. This word comfortless is interesting in Greek is orphanos, which means the same as orphan to us, fatherless, parentless, comfortless. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. From Elder Holland, Because Jesus walked such a long, lonely path utterly alone, we do not have to do so. His solitary journey brought great company for our little version of that path. The merciful care of our Father in heaven, the unfailing companionship of his beloved son, the consummate gift of the Holy Ghost, angels in heaven, family members on both sides of the veil, prophets and apostles, teachers, leaders, and friends. All of these and more have been given as companions for our mortal journey because of the atonement of Jesus Christ and the restoration of his gospel. Trumpeted from the summit of Calvary is the truth that we will never be left alone nor unaided. Even if sometimes we may feel that we are, truly the Redeemer of all of us said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you and abide with you. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. President Ballard. Just hours before he was to begin that glorious yet awful process of the atonement, the Lord Jesus Christ made this significant promise to his apostles. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. 
Was he promising his beloved associates the kind of peace the world recognizes? Safety, security, with the absence of contention or tribulation? Certainly the historical record would suggest otherwise. Those original apostles knew much of trial and persecution throughout the remainder of their lives, which is probably why the Lord added this insight to his promise. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. He continued, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Peace, real peace, whole soul to the very core of your being, comes only in and through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. John fourteen thirty one. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So they leave the Last Supper, and he's ready to go to complete his mission, which is, of course, the atonement of Jesus Christ and his death and then resurrection. Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it might bring forth more fruit. When he's talking about purging, he's talking about pruning or trimming. Of course, this is a great reminder of the current bush, the great talk that was given by Hubie Brown, God is the gardener here. I really suggest that you take a look at that, and so I've put a link in the description there. It was also recently addressed by Elder Christofferson, I think, in general conference. Verse 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If we detach ourselves from the vine, we are lost. From Elder Talmadge, a grander analogy is not to be found in the world's literature. Those ordained servants of the Lord were as helpless and useless without him as a bough severed from the tree. As a branch is made fruitful, only by virtue of the nourishing sap it receives from the rooted trunk, and if cut away or broken off, withers, dries, and becomes utterly worthless, except as fuel for the burning, so those men, though ordained to the holy apostleship, would find themselves strong and fruitful in good works, only as they remained in steadfast communion with the Lord. Without Christ, what were they but unschooled Galileans, some of them fishermen, one a publican, the rest of undistinguished attainments, and all of them weak mortals. Verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. From the seminary manual, while the Father and the Son love us with a perfect and everlasting love, keeping their commandments allows us to receive a fullness of blessings they lovingly desire to give us. And then from President Nelson, surely the best evidence of our adoration of Jesus is our emulation of him. Verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. From President Hinckley. Jesus is my friend. None other has given me so much. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He gave his life for me. He opened the way to eternal life. Only a God could do this. I hope that I am deemed worthy of being friend to him. From Elder Costa, Jesus 
gave us the supreme example of love when he declared greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He later atoned for all our sins and finally gave his life for all of us. We can lay down our lives for those we love, not by physically dying for them, but rather by living for them, giving of our time, always being present in their lives, serving them, being courteous, affectionate, and showing true love for those of our family and to all men as the Savior taught. Verse 18, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would have loved his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. For if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. From Elder Hales, one of mortality's greatest tests comes when our beliefs are questioned or criticized. In such moments, we may want to respond aggressively to put up your dukes, but these are important opportunities to step back, pray, and follow the Lord's example. Remember that Jesus himself was despised and rejected by the world. When we respond to our accusers as the Savior did, we not only become more Christ-like, we invite others to feel his love and follow him as well. To respond in a Christ-like way cannot be scripted or based on a formula. The Savior responded differently in every situation. When he was confronted by wicked King Herod, he remained silent. When he stood before Pilate, he bore a simple and powerful testimony of his divinity and purpose. Facing the money changers who were defiling the temple, he exercised his divine responsibility to preserve and protect that which was sacred. Lifted upon the cross, he uttered the incomparable Christian response, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The prophet Joseph demonstrated Christian courage throughout his life. He did not retaliate or give in to hatred. Like all true disciples of Christ, he stood with the Savior by loving others in a tolerant and compassionate way. That is Christian courage. When we do not retaliate, when we turn the other cheek and resist feelings of anger, we too stand with the Savior. We show forth his love, which is the only power that can subdue the adversary and answer our accusers without accusing them in return. That is not weakness. That is Christian courage. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. John 16, verse 5. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you askest me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. From the Bible Dictionary, for some reason not fully explained in the scriptures, the Holy Ghost did not operate in fullness among the Jews during the years of Jesus' mortal sojourn. Statements to the effect that the Holy Ghost did not come until after Jesus was resurrected must of necessity refer to that particular dispensation only. For it is abundantly clear that the Holy Ghost was operative in earlier dispensations. Furthermore, it has reference only to the gift of the Holy Ghost not being present, since the power of the Holy Ghost was operative during the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus. Otherwise, no one could have received a testimony of the truth that these men taught. Verse 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall ye speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while you shall see me, because I go to the Father. From President Oaks. This personal line of communication with our Heavenly Father through his Holy Spirit is the source of our testimony, of truth, of knowledge, and of our personal guidance from a loving Heavenly Father. It is an essential feature 
of his marvelous gospel plan, which allows each of one of his children to receive a personal witness of the truth. Verse 20, verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. From Elder Cook. The source of the kind of joy which causes us to rejoice is an understanding of the plan of salvation. The Savior in the Gospel of John was approaching the closing hour of his mortal life when he would take upon himself the sins of the world. As he prepared his disciples for what he knew was to come, he told them, A little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while ye shall see me. They were not yet ready to comprehend the resurrection. Instead, the Savior explained in gentle terms that he would leave and return, and told them what they would feel, sorrow at his leaving, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Just as the Savior's death brought sorrow, the vicissitudes of life, like death, disease, poverty, and injury, can and often will bring unhappiness. Separation from those we love invariably brings sorrow and mourning. Life is not easy, and it would be improper to diminish in any way the trials and tribulations that most experience. That having been said, the resurrection and atonement wrought by the Savior and the promise of eternal life with our loved ones are of such overwhelming significance that to not rejoice would demonstrate a lack of understanding of the Savior's gift. Joy comes when we have the Spirit in our lives. When we have the Spirit, we rejoice in what the Savior has done for us. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. From President Monson. Let us be of good cheer as we go about our lives. Although we live in an increasingly perilous times, the Lord loves us and is mindful of us. He is always on our side as we do what is right. He will help us in the time of need. Our lives can also be filled with joy as we follow the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Lord admonished, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What great happiness this knowledge bring to us. He lived for us and he died for us. He paid the price for our sins. May we emulate his example. May we show our great gratitude to him by accepting his sacrifice and living lives that will qualify us to return and one day live with him. From President McKay, this text, referring to John 17, is taken from one of the most glorious prayers, I suppose the greatest prayer ever uttered in this world, not accepting the Lord's Prayer. This was Christ's prayer uttered just before he entered into the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his betrayal. I know of no more important chapter in the Bible. From the seminary manual. At some point between the time when the Savior and his disciples had eaten the Last Supper and when they entered the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus offered a prayer that is traditionally known as the intercessory prayer. One meaning of the word intercede is to speak to someone on behalf of another person. In this case, Jesus Christ spoke to Heavenly Father in behalf of his disciples, pleading that they might receive eternal life. Unlike the Synoptic Gospels, the Gospel of John does not give an account of the Savior's prayers or suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. But what John did record adds to and illuminates the meaning of the events recorded in the other Gospels. The Savior's intercessory prayer recorded only in John provides valuable insights about the purposes of the atonement. So John 17, 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee 
before the world was. I'd like to talk a little bit about this word glorified or glory. In Greek, it's doxa, which does mean glory, but from the Latin, glory means to illuminate, to, to increase in light. Some other definitions are dignify, honor, praise, or worship. I like the word honor here. I have honored thee on the earth. I have finished the works that thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, honor thou me with thine own self, with the honor which I had with thee before the world was. To me, glory has kind of a negative connotation in the modern world, and so I like the word honor, but that's just me. From Elder John Ute, we need to recognize that knowing the Savior is the most important pursuit of our lives. It should take priority over anything else. Verse 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou givest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. This is the same Greek word perfect that you find in Matthew 5, 48, be therefore perfect, or fulfilled, or finished, or complete. That the world may know that thou hast sent me, thou hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. From Elder Holland. The literal meaning of the English word atonement is self-evident. At one meant. The bringing together of things that have been separated or estranged. From Elder Faust. We should earnestly seek not just to know about the master, but to strive as he invited to be one with him. The days ahead will be filled with affliction and difficulty with the assuring comfort of a personal relationship with God, we will be given a calming courage. From Elder Christofferson, Surely we will not be one with God the Father and Christ until we make their will and interest our greatest desire. Such submissiveness is not reached in a day, but through the Holy Spirit. The Lord will tutor us if we are willing until in the process of time, it may be accurately said that he is in us as the Father is in him. At times I tremble to consider what might be required, but I know that it is only in this perfect union that a fullness of joy can be found. I am grateful beyond expression that I am invited to be one with those holy beings. I revere and worship as my heavenly Father and Redeemer. Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. From gospel topic essays are Mormon Christians. Scholars have long acknowledged that the view of God held by the earliest Christians changed dramatically over the course of centuries. Early Christian views of God were more personal, more anthropomorphic, and less abstract than those that emerged later from the creeds written in the next several hundred years. The key ideological shift that began in the second century after the loss of the apostolic authority resulted from a conceptual merger of Christian doctrine with Greek philosophy. Latter-day Saints believe the melding of early Christian theology with Greek philosophy was a grave error. Chief among the doctrines lost in this process was the nature of the Godhood. The true nature of God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. As a consequence, Latter-day Saints hold that God the Father is an embodied being, a belief consistent with the attributes ascribed to God by many early Christians. This Latter-day Saint belief differs from the post-New Testament creeds. Whatever the doctrinal differences that exist between the Latter-day Saints and members of other Christian religions, the roles Latter-day Saints ascribe to members of the Godhead largely correspond with the views of others in the Christian world. Latter-day Saints believe that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and all-loving, and they pray to him in the name of Jesus Christ. They acknowledge the Father as the ultimate object of their worship. 
the Son as Lord and Redeemer, the Holy Spirit as the messenger and revealer of the Father and the Son. In short, Latter-day Saints do not accept the post-New Testament creeds, yet rely deeply on each of the member of the Godhead in their daily religious devotion and worship, as did the early Christians. From Elder Grow, the Savior taught us that the very best way to know God is to become like him. He taught, therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. Worthiness is essential to becoming like him. God knows you and invites you to know him. Pray to the Father. Study the scriptures. Seek to do God's will. Strive to become like the Savior and follow righteous mentors. And as you do, you will come to know God and Jesus Christ, and you will inherit eternal life. Certainly, if we want to follow him, we need to become like him. I testify that through reading the scriptures, understanding him, understanding his ways, understanding what would Jesus do, we can become like him. And because of his atonement, his death and resurrection, that we can overcome both the physical limitations that we have, this physical death, and this separation from God, this spiritual death that we've undergone. And that because of him, we can return as righteous families back to live with our heavenly parents. And of this I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Have, Have a, great a great week.